In the last general election, GE13, the opposition coalition, Pakatan Rakyat, won a majority of the popular vote at 51%. That's right. But it was only 40% of the seats. That's right. Um, analysts alleged that there was systematic rigging taking place so that the ruling coalition uh, will be kept in power. Is that true? Yes, uh, the rigging basically uh, happens uh, due to the way the election boundaries are drawn. And there are two problems here. One is the problem of size. We call it a male apportionment, whereby some constituencies are much larger than other constituencies within the same state. Uh, taking an example, for example, uh, Slango, uh, you have uh, Sabah Burnham that has about 37,000 voters. Then at the same time, Kappa has 144,000 in the same state, almost uh, four times the size. So that is called male apportionment. The second problem, why uh, that result was such, was due to gerrymandering. Now, gerrymandering is where the boundaries are drawn in such a way that it favours a certain political party. Uh, and usually when you look at the shape of such boundary, they are very odd, very odd shape. And that is called gerrymandering. So with these two together, uh, it gave you the result that we had. And that is about 52% voted for the opposition, but the opposition got only 40% of the vote. Uh, our analysts uh, did a further calculation asking the question, then how many percent at the last election uh, should the opposition, opposition get before they could form a government uh, with a simple majority of two seats? And the calculation came up to at least 58% of the vote. All right, that would, that's the situation we, we have right now. Um, could you say what, in the simplest of terms, so that m many people uh, will understand, what mm -hmm. is delineation and what does it involve? Yeah, uh, delineation or, or it's also called delimitation as well, is a necessary process uh, in... Uh, in a country where there is uh, uh, elections because population uh, size changes from areas to area. Some areas, come, some constituency uh, see an increase because of uh, people moving into those areas mm -hmm. and then some places seeing a decrease. So if you don't make this sort of adjustment then you will have uh, a very disproportionate sizes in this constituency. And what that means is that it wouldn't be fair that some people, uh, um, very few of them get one representation, then another place, a lot of voters, one representation. So this is a necessary process. And in Malaysia, it, can, it must be done after every eight years. Okay, so, so when was the last um, okay. exercise done? The, the last delineation in Malaysia was uh, in 2003 mm -hmm. for Peninsula and Sabah. And for Sarawak, Sarawak it was uh, in 2005. Why is there a difference? Um, Why 2003 for those two? Yeah. And Sarawak uh, was... Yes, I mean, uh, Sarawak state election has always been held at a different time from the rest mm -hmm. of the country and uh, that was uh, the reason why they had a separate timing but this time round we uh, expect the election commission to do the delineation exercise for the whole country including Sarawak mm -hmm. together so, yeah so they they de they are delayed aren't they because this is more than 8 years Yes, yes. Uh, the earliest uh, it could have been uh, done was probably 2011. But at that time, uh, the election uh, was about to be called. All of us were expecting GE 
13 to be called anytime by Prime Minister Najib. So the Election Commission did not go ahead with the delineation then. And now that it is over, we definitely uh, expect and EC has also announced that they will be doing it pretty soon. Yes. Perhaps you could explain to viewers why is this important? Why is delineation important? Well, it's important because uh, in short, when uh, election boundaries are not drawn fairly, as we uh, can see from the current delineation, um, it basically will determine the outcome of elections after delineation. Uh, when the boundaries are manipulated in such a way, what it means that uh, the voice of the people, the votes of the people, oftentimes in many places doesn't count. Like in this case, when you had a majority voting for the opposition this time, you would have expect that that should reflect the will of the people in the number of seats in the parliament. But far from it, uh, for Barisan, with only 47% of the vote, they still managed to get 60% of the parliament seat. I think that is something that is should be of concern to all Malaysians, that our votes uh, have been uh, manipulated in such a way. Um. What is OPOV? OV? Okay, uh, that stands for one person, one vote, and one value. And okay. is that something to do with delineation? Very much so, because uh, our federal constitution, uh, Schedule 13, um, uh, Part 1, Section 2C, say that every constituency that are delineated should be approximately equal in size. Every constituency that are delineated should be approximately equal. Now, when you have a situation where uh, certain constituency are four times the size of another one, what it means that the value of your constituency, let's say you are the one in, in the big constituency, mm. is just one quarter that of the other voter in the other constituency. So the value is not the same. Yes, you get one vote, uh, you, are, you got your one vote, but your value is different from the other person. And that's a problem. Yeah, and do you think many Malaysians are aware of, of this discrepancy? No. Uh, I think the ordinary voter, you know, most of the time uh, when they come to election, uh, they probably have an idea who they want to vote for. Mm. And the, the other thing that they want to know is which school are they going to cast their vote in. You know? that's, that's their main concern. That's their main concern. They are not even uh, concerned or aware that they perhaps at the last election were voting for this constituency mm. but you know this election they are now changed to vote in another constituency a lot of voters are not even aware of that sort of uh, redrawing in in this delineation um, uh, exercise it, is it supposed to represent a part of the population and if so what is how much? How many? What is the percentage of the population that it's supposed to represent? Uh, the uh, delineation. I mean, of the uh, of of the area of the constituency. All vote. All registered voters. Okay. Know? Yeah. So, uh, all registered voter in Malaysia at the last election, if I'm not mistaken, is about thirteen million. Yeah. Uh, registered voter. So uh, they should be, by right, equally represented in uh, the parliament or in the state assemblies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, at, at independence time, or soon after Merdeka, for instance, mm -hmm. um, 
what was was it so unfairly distributed do you know okay at after medeca the original federal constitution that we have stipulated that every constituency should be approximately equal and they even spell out what they meant by approximately equal by putting a band of plus 15% or minus 15% so, so from the is, average. Oh, so there's an error of margin. Yes, Ma an error of margin Ma that is a, or that's allowed to basically uh, 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 stop any... Uh, so to explain rather, I think could add edit this part. Okay, the 15% uh, plus minus 15% is basically to explain uh, what is meant by approximately equal, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you take, for example, the state of uh, Slango, the number of voters at the last election for Slango is about 2 million, mm -hmm. and you have 22 parliamentary seats. So that works out to be the average for every parliamentary seat in Slango should be 93,000 voters. Okay. okay. Now, plus 15%, that would mean that it should not be more than approximately 115,000 mm -hmm. voters. Minus 15% means it cannot be less than like 73,000 voters. But yeah. the situation was that Kappa had 100 and 44,000, Sabah Brunam 37,000. So, uh, without the plus minus 15%, EC was free to interpret themselves what is approximately equal. So, the original constitution, constitution had this limit, but through the different uh, amendment to the, this part of the constitution in 1963, uh, and then in 1972 itself, uh, this limit was totally removed and EC is free to interpret what they mean by approximately equal. Uh, it's fairly ludicrous, you know, it's like saying that uh, someone who is uh, 150 kilo in weight is approximately the same size as someone who is 40 kilo in weight, they are approximately the same. So uh, it just doesn't make sense. And who polices the EC or who sort of checks on them? No one actually. Uh, EC by the, the very uh, definition and the charter they have, they are in, supposed to be independent. Yes. Yeah, they are appointed by the king and so they are only accountable to the king, to the Agong, not even to the uh, government of the day. But uh, I think over the years, uh, it has become a case that the EC now reports to the Prime Minister's department. Is there an international norm? for this delineation exercise? Yes, uh, there are uh, various uh, international best uh, practices mm -hmm. uh, for delineation. Uh, when it comes to sizes, uh, some countries take plus minus 10% mm -hmm. as a guide of what it means by approximately equal the constituency size. Some takes 15%, but uh, there has to be some sort of limit so that to maintain the one person, one vote, one value. Okay. Um, there is a delineation exercise being carried out right now. Is not that, yet. Not yet. Mm. So it's going, when is it going to...? Uh, that only the EC knows. Um, they are overdue for a delineation exercise. Yes. But uh, it has not started yet. The process basically uh, would start by when the EC informs the Prime Minister and the Speaker of the Dewan Rakyat mm -hmm. that they 
want to begin the process. Now, after the, the notification, then we will wait for EC to publish in the national newspaper, at least one major newspaper, the location of the new maps, their new proposal, uh, where you can find this new map, usually will be in uh, the uh, town council, uh, district office. This is where you can see the map being displayed. Now, once that happened, um, the citizens have 30 days. This is provided for by the constitution that uh, citizens have a right to uh, view the map and if there is anything that is objectionable because it is unfair mm -hmm. or is unconstitutional, then within that 30 days of display, uh, groups of 100 or more registered voters in that constituency can lodge a complaint, uh, an objection to EC in the 30 day. What do you mean by groups of 100 or more? So you got to have at least 100? At least 100 registered voters in that constituency. For example, if you're objecting to the parliamentary constituency, yeah. you have to gather 100 or more of your fellow voters there and then uh, view the map and find out what is objectionable and then lodge a complaint, uh, 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 an objection to the EC within that 30 days together with the names of the 100 or more. And, and are there uh, forms to fill in or do you have to write in? How, how is it done? Uh, Just in case somebody is interested. Right. Uh, EC doesn't give you a form but basically for us in uh, that um, we are that is a program that is uh, started by uh, this uh, Brasse, mm -hmm. and it is it stands for delineation action and research team. We have come up with a letter whereby uh, someone who is interested to be one of the the uh, objector can sign this standard letter. Then we will attach it together with the. Uh, letter of objection that we will be sending to the EC in the 30 days. Now, once that is sent to the EC, EC will have a look at it and if the objections are based on the constitution, you know, not just based on your personal preference as an individual or party, but you object to it because it violated certain guidelines uh, laid out in the constitution, then the EC will have to call for an inquiry with the representative of the hundred or more. They will set a, a date where you come and meet the EC and explain to them why you object to them. And um, then you make a proposal to EC how perhaps the boundary should be redrawn. And if it's reasonable to the EC, they will then go back and make a revision to the map. And how many days are they given to revise uh, after an it's objection? It's not stipulated uh, how many days, but the whole process, uh, the EC has two years to complete it. So, two years. Okay, so, so when this delineation um, exercise is undertaken by the EC, mm -hmm. is it for the whole of the country or do they do it in, uh, state by state? It will be for the whole country. All at once? All at once. So if there were many objections, they would have to get it all sorted out yes, within yes. the two-year period? Um, the uh, state uh, office of the EC mm -hmm. uh, the, would hold the meeting. So you will be called either to the office of the EC in your state mm -hmm. or in another meeting place that they stipulate. Uh, so it will be held simultaneously throughout the country. Well, that seems a very major undertaking if there were a lot of objections. Uh, yes, yes. And I, I, I think this will, because there is a time frame of two years to complete it, this would uh, put uh, a lot of pressure on EC, mm -hmm. basically uh, to hear 
the views of the affected voters. Yeah. And am I right in saying that they have to resolve this apart from within the two years, but before the next general election or any by election or? Uh, or by not? elections are hard hard to say. You know, they you don't know when that that will happen. <laughs> But certainly, they are looking at completing this um, before the next general election, yeah, mm. which could be three years to or four years from now. But it has to be done first. It has to be done first. Uh, uh, if it's for some reason not done, you know, yes, then uh, the next election will see. Uh, similar situation that we had at the last election, probably worse. Kappa, for example, would probably be 160,000, yeah. whereas uh, Sabah Murnam will still remain 37,000. But how did it get to such a bad state like that? Population growth, uh, new development in certain housing area. Uh, so over time, naturally, constituency sizes do change. Okay, And that's why the alienation is to adjust that. To make adjustment for that. Yeah, but but um, it seems like very large mm. uh, increase, let's say. And then what about the MP for that area? Wasn't he concerned? Did he voice it to the EC and they did nothing? Or um, yes, I mean uh, if they are aware of of uh, this uh, dispro disproportionate sizes. You know, they would be concerned and will have a sense that it is unfair on them that they have to serve so many constituents voters compared to their colleague in another constituency. Uh, and that is why uh, every um, elected or would be elected uh, uh, politician should be very interested in this process so that to make sure that it is fair on them. You know, what happens in the rural areas, especially mm -hmm. in in Sarawak, where it's all uh, yes. spread out? If if you don't get your hundred people to mm -hmm. object, and how would they know what to object to? Um, getting a hundred is not a real problem because uh, most constituency, even the state constituency. In Sarawak is at least eight thousand voters, yeah. So out of eight thousand, to get a hundred is not an issue. Now whether they know what to object or not, and this is where and why Brasse has come up with this program called that. Our we have been going around the country, uh, training people, informing them what are the uh, guidelines provided by the constitution. When it comes to delineation, you know, so that when when EC delineate against that, then you know that that is a ground for objection. Uh, so we have been doing the training in all the states in in uh, Peninsula and also in Sabah and Sarawak, uh, and uh, the hope is that more people will join into this process so that they can monitor their own constituency. But we will provide the training for them. When was that formed? Uh, and exactly. why? Exactly. It was formed, uh, it was officially launched on the 9th of March 2014. So it's quite a new thing. Quite a new thing, you know, but the uh, development of this program uh, started at the end of uh, last year, 2013 around October, November and uh, why simply because this is if you want free and fair election I think this has to be one of the main thing to do. Who initiated DART and was it because of the GE13 or it, was it just set up by a few individuals or per se? Maybe you could explain. Sure. Uh, the, the idea or rather the the person that was very instrumental in uh, raising the importance of redelineation was uh, Dr. Wong Chin Huat. And uh, basically, when he uh, conducted that forum, uh, 
we in Engage, I'm, I'm with an organization called Engage based in Johor. We were very impressed uh, by him about the importance of delineation and we wanted to do something. So from there, we decided to work together with Dr. Wong and uh, came up with uh, this program that we named that basically we took a very technical, a very legal topic, you know, and put it in such a way that uh, even a layman not just can only uh, not just able to understand the process, but is able to uh, play an active role in uh, monitoring the election boundary for their area, because who knows. Uh, the electoral boundary better than the voters who are living there you know so we believe in that and that's why we go to uh, every state and even uh, uh, every district uh, that invites us to do this training so that they can be aware so anybody can go for training or anybody. How, how do people find out about it uh, we have been using the so social media and also uh, sometimes the press also does cover some of our training in the different states. Um, but uh, I think that uh, there's still room for more people to participate in this. And uh, if you are interested in this uh, training, you can contact uh, Brasse's office. Uh, and uh, then we will arrange for our trainers to come to you and conduct the training. And is the training very difficult? Is it over several days? It is over three hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's divided into two parts. The, f the first part is just uh, the presentation, basically uh, giving you the information, why it is important and what are the things that we can look out for when boundaries are drawn. Then the second part of the training, second half of it, is where we get hands-on. Uh, Dart has come up with an approach whereby we put the uh, election boundaries okay, uh, onto Google Earth. Now, if you know Google Earth, basically it's a free program from Google that you can download then you can install the files that we give you that will contain uh, four la layers of uh, boundaries the first layer will be the parliamentary boundary that is the current parliamentary boundary the second layer will be the uh, state uh, boundary state assembly boundary okay mm -hmm. we call the don Huh? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then the most important layer will be the Daira Mundi or the polling district boundaries. Okay, polling district. Um, and then we have another layer, and that is the local authority boundaries. Peha Brakwasa Tempatan, or we call it PBT boundaries. Because one of the criteria when you do delineation, is basically you need uh, EC need to draw the parliamentary and state uh, boundaries within this PBT okay uh, and with those layers then you can see when they are not following it and you need to know why they are not following it the boundaries so we provide these four layers so in the training that we conduct the, the second half of it, we will show the trainees how they can actually uh, build their own proposed uh, boundary that are compliant to the constitution. So at the end of the three hours, in most of our training, the, the local team are ready to go. You know, <laughs> they are ready to, to uh, propose the boundary and they are more familiar with their own uh, boundaries as well. And do you work together with the EC? Is there any cooperation or engagement? Um, 
we we have uh, some engagement, some dialogue, but uh, because there are certain fundamental things that we are not in agreement uh, with the EC. For example, the size of the con- constituency. Uh, EC uh, has a, a different way of uh, defining uh, what is the right size. You know, to us that is against the constitution. Uh, they have three category. They have uh, urban seats that are for parliament for parliament ranges between seventy to ninety thousand voters. Then they have semi urban that ranges from fifty thousand to seventy thousand voters, and then they have rural seats that uh, for them is from thirty to fifty thousand. Now that means that the smallest seat is 30,000, the biggest is 90,000, three times the size. Now, the constituents say it should be approximately equal. Yes. Yeah. So, who is to interpret that? I believe the court has to interpret that. Um, this exercise that, you're, that they are about to embark on and you're waiting because mm-hmm. uh, to place your objections or to agree, mm-hmm. um, is this a first? This exercise? No. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it will be the sixth, if not the seventh, redelineation exercise conducted by the EC. Yeah, um, sorry, is, is it going to be the first where people like DART, Percy, the civil society, yes, and the public. Uh, yeah, keeping a close watch on things. I I believe this will be the first time ever. Ever. That uh, civil society, and uh, through them the general public, is very aware of this the importance of this process, and also very aware that they have a right to object and to input into the delineation. This will be the first time. Uh, in the past uh, exercises, oftentimes uh, even politicians, especially opposition politicians, are, are not even fully aware. You know, and it just, in that 30 days, uh, it will go through and in about six, seven months, the whole exercise is completed. Oh, so do you know of any objections placed in the past, in the six yes. or seven? The last one we know, uh, at the first display in Peninsular Malaysia, there were about 200 and, uh, sorry, it was about 400 objections received. And, w- and were they all um, resolved? Uh, half of them were considered as not fulfilling the condition, you know, do not fulfill the criteria. Half of them were not, uh, were not considered fully fulfilling the condition. And uh, the other half uh, were considered as fulfilling the condition. But what we found out was that uh, by right, EC should have rejected those that do not fulfill condition. Now they do not fulfill condition because they do not have the hundred uh, affected voters. Okay. You know, it was submitted by an individual. Uh, what we found out was that EC also considered many of this oh. because they were submitted by politician. I see. Yeah, politician, politician from both both divide. In fact, uh, we believe that more of the. Uh, Barisan national politician objected than the opposition at the last delineation because they were more aware of the importance of this. We've heard so many stories about the EC that they're not mm. impartial and they're following orders from somewhere. Um, how do you work with an organization which already has a reputation that is tarnished? How do you, how do you ensure fairness I, I think we, if we do nothing, you know, because we say EC is not fair, then they have a free hand to even uh, do more damage mm. to this to electoral system, and therefore 
though we know that there are many challenges uh, to have a, a free and fair election, I think we have to get involved. We have to basically get involved with the process of delineation to push for uh, as fair a boundary as we can get. Because if we don't, then I would say we probably don't even need to bother to vote at the next election. <laughs> Could Would you like to explain to us about Engage? Yes. Um, Engage is the NGO that I, I founded last year. But uh, it came about because a group of us, uh, ordinary citizens, um, got interested in the uh, political process of the country after GE12 uh, 2008 um, we felt that uh, there was hope that it was possible uh, for Malaysians to to have a direct say in what's happening in the country so we started uh, basically volunteering ourselves as uh, to to register new voters. Uh, then after that we conducted Pachaba training, that is the training of polling agent, counting agent and booth agent. Uh, we conducted those training in, in the South in Johor. Then we also organized uh, many forums and also participated in the Brasse rallies mm -hmm. as well. Uh, then after GE13, we decided to basically that um, the struggle for free and fair election must continue and we need to be better organized. So that's, uh, that's when we decided a group of us uh, to form Engage because we believe that the only way forward for this country, Malaysia, is that ordinary citizens like us uh, engage the the process, the political process directly, instead of uh, waiting for the election, instead of uh, leaving it just to the politician, we want our voices heard, and that's why we got uh, involved and started engage. And you work in tandem with other NGOs. Very much so. Very much so. Um, engage. Uh, uh, is one of the endorsing uh, NGO of Brasse. Brasse is a coalition of of uh, NGOs that support free and fair election, and Engage is just uh, one of them. So we basically uh, uh, work closely with the other NGOs uh, in our city, and now we have also uh, started a chapter in the Klang Valley. Engage Central and uh, we are also working closely with other NGO in the Klang Valley as well um, so that is uh, what we are doing basically Engage uh, what, what we do is really to translate ideas you know ideas for nation building into action you know actions that can be implemented by the ordinary citizen. So you're empowering the old man in the street? Uh, that is our, our heart, okay. it is to see the ordinary citizen empowered. Yeah. And if people were interested in, in what you do, what would you suggest, to, how would they contact you? Or mm. Well, they can, uh, the easiest way is to uh, uh, type www.engage.org.my uh, Dot org dot my, and that will bring you for now to our Engage Facebook page. Okay. Okay, and you can uh, message uh, us over there, or just to follow us and be updated as to what we are doing. And how many members have you got, or how many have you helped in? Uh, in each of the chapter uh, in in the south, we are only about fifteen uh, people. But uh, we work strategically in partnership with other groups, other NGOs. Um, 
Would you like to say something about what is happening in Malaysia right now, especially uh, with respect to the sedition sweep that is going on? Mm. Have you any views about sure, that? Sure, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, it is something of grave concern uh, to to us as Malaysian that uh, to see so many people, uh, both activists, politicians, uh, academics, uh, student activists being charged, investigated for allegedly saying seditious thing. I think um, if Malaysia is to wants to be considered as a progressive, modern and moderate society, then there has to be more space given for people to air their views and even to disagree with uh, the establishment. I think this sort of a clamp down uh, in this day and age is really an exercise in futility because uh, people have, have access to information, they know what is happening and uh, it is totally not acceptable in uh, this day and age where you need as a government to be engaging the citizen rather than clamping them down. I know you're not with um, Global Bursay but you have um, ties with Bursay. Mm. If Malaysians overseas would like to get more involved, what would you suggest they do? There is a very, there are very important uh, roles I believe uh, Malaysians overseas and I know many still care for the nation very much uh, can do because one of the struggle in Malaysia for us in Brasse is the control of the establishment, the government over the media you know and it is very hard for the truth to get out you know and we believe that one area that Malaysian overseas can play is basically to uh, make known what is actually happening in Malaysia, whether it is this uh, clampdown using the Sedition Act, whether it is uh, manipulation of our electoral system. Uh, uh, the world actually need to know that Malaysia as a member of the world community is not playing by the rule, you know. And I think if they could uh, work with uh, activists wherever they are uh, to get to the international media, that is one way. So hi highlight what's happening highlight back what's in happening. Malaysia. Yeah. Um, what about discussion groups amongst themselves? brainstorming ideas? Um, certainly, uh, I think in, in, in the, any ideas, any good ideas, doesn't matter where it comes from, uh, we would definitely welcome and we want to uh, see more concerted effort if uh, there is a campaign, whether it is launched from uh, Malaysia or from overseas, I think we want to be coordinated. I think one great example would be uh, the Bursay rally, especially Bursay 3.0, where in a very short span of time, Malaysians globally, you know, and nationally got together on the, that one day uh, to uh, highlight a very important issue of free and fair election. And I think something like that would be a, a great uh, thing that we can uh, put together on. What is your hope for Malaysia and the young, the youth of Malaysia? That it will be what it is supposed to be. A country that is blessed 
blessed with uh, not just natural resources but blessed with a rich heritage rich uh, uh, multi-racial uh, culture and uh, heritage I think that is something that we have that many countries will die for and yet we are not making the most of it and my hope for Malaysia is that we will look at each other not by the ethnicity that that uh, of the, uh, where our forefathers came from but we will look at each other as as uh, Malaysians you know and we are judged not just by our race or religion but we are judged by uh, our character our values uh, that is the Malaysia that I hope for and work towards thank you very much Thomas thank you